National Geographic's Barkskins limited series is set in 1690 New France with Marcia Gay Harden playing innkeeper Mathilde Jafar. Now, I'm Riley Chow of Gold Derby. Uh, Marcia, we've seen you on screen for over three decades. You have an Oscar and a Tony. How or why do you have it in you to get out there uh, into the wilderness to film the show? Well, first of all, I'm a working mom, so uh, it doesn't matter how long I've been working, I want to still keep working. But this was something new, Riley. It was um, a time that I know nothing about, a situation that I know very little about, which was the moment when uh, people were coming from France to New France, which was in Quebec, in Canada, and trying to occupy it. Again, and they were fighting the uh, English and the Hudson's Bay Company and the native people there as well, the Iroquois, the Windus, and they were all just fighting against each other for control of this land. It's based on the, a beautiful Annie Prue book, which uh, people may know her work from Brokeback Mountain or Shipping News. I love her writing, and I was already reading the book, and I loved it. And then when I heard that Elwood and Scott Rudin were doing this, I was like, okay, I'm begging, I wanna be a part of it so much. And she was just like a woman that I, I've never, I've never seen anyone like her. I, I don't know this character in television. I've never seen a television show that's gonna cover this kind of thing. And it was kind of uh, this scary, exciting time of exploration and battle. And uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a hard decision to make actually to join it. Is she in the book, your character, Matilda? Good point. She's not, right? So when I was first reading it and loving, you know, basically the book is a story of, you know, people will say it's a story of the deforestation of America, the Americas, I should say, from the 1690s through to modern day. And really it's a story of the haves and the have-nots. It's a story of how, you know, one indentured servant goes on to becoming um, a billionaire and he's the kind of He's kind of conniving one. And then the other indentured servant, who's a really loyal one, marries a, a native woman, and they go on to have nothing. And we know that's the true story of Canada and, and uh, the U.S., that the native peoples didn't end up with a lot, and the billionaires were the people who sort of raped and pillaged the land. So that's what the story is, and you track them over about – 300 years. Our story just sticks in the 1690s. So it's like the first 100 pages of Annie Prue's book. And Matilda's not in it. You are so right. It really focuses mainly the first 100 pages, mostly uh, focuses on the loggers and or the bark skins um, and the early pioneers, the, uh, the settlers, but the, the men. It focuses on the men, how they came over, the struggles they had, what a testosterone driven environment it was, but there had to be some women there. So when I was speaking to Elwood about it, I felt like a dork. I said, like, Elwood, um, this character, she's not in the book, right? And he's like, no, nah, I'm writing her completely. And then he sort of took off and wrote this woman who was incredibly strong and incredibly nurturing, but she's also a real ball buster. And, um, and he said he was like, he, he literally gave me a line that said, I will club your balls into your belly. And he, said, he wrote that after he knew that I was going to play it. I was like, yes. Now, uh, I don't know how much you want to say, but they call this a uh, limited series. Uh, as you were just talking about, the book, it spans centuries. Um, so do you know if there are plans to come back for a second season or if, you know, it would be with the same group of characters? Yes, um, we hope there's plans. I think right now everything is just so uncertain and our premiere got pushed up a bit. We weren't planning to premiere until, premiere until November and then you kind of wait and see do people like it or not. I can't see how they wouldn't. Like by the time you get to episode eight, it's kind of like it's like a slow moving, just slow start, slow start, slow start. And then you go, 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 go. There's a lot to take in. But by the time you get to eight, you're like, no, don't end. How can you end right there? So I'm really praying that there is a season two or three. I know that Elwood had the opportunity to write, you know, every year a new decade. So what, like by the next time it would be um, uh, Trepanier's servants who carry the story forward. Um, but he said, no, these are really rich characters. I've got a great cast. I want to stay with these people. So if we do have other seasons, I think we'll spend a couple years with these people. 
Um, and if people love the show, maybe eventually we'll go on to the next generation, which means my character dies out. <laughs> uh, tell me more about how the show has moved up. Uh, we thought that Genius was going to be airing in that kind of uh, end of May slot for Nat Geo. Uh, they didn't finish. Now you're airing here. Uh, what does that change for you in terms of press or anything else? Well, what happened was that um, Genius got shut down. And we had already finished shooting. You know, we were in the can ready to go. So it kind of made sense that we would go now. I think serendipitously, it's a story about survival against all odds. And their struggle for survival was, you know, against everything hostile in the environment. I think people draw some correlations right now to, to how together as a community, etc. I try not to stretch it too far because I feel like all the concerns are universal concerns, all the desires are universal desires, and, and any human desire and human emotion and human struggle is timeless. Like we're still going through the same struggles now that we went through then. We just have washing machines instead of bringing them out on the pole, right? Um, but so they decided once a genius wasn't going to be able to go because they got shut down, they decided to move us up. And I think what happened I mean, there's nothing adverse, it's all great. It's just that we didn't really have time to prepare audiences to do the little bits of press. So this is just amazing. I'm glad we're getting to do it because I think we want to raise people's awareness level of what's coming. Uh, the, the, the show's opening Memorial Day weekend and we want people to be watching and talking about it and, and sharing it. Yeah, the show is coming very fast. We don't have uh, a lot of information about how it was made. Uh, what can you tell me about shooting up in uh, Quebec? Oh, it was awesome. Um, we were staying in the Quebec City, which, you know, is really dangerous only because they have every great restaurant you could ever want to go to. So you're trying to fit into a corset, and you're like, oh, I just really want to go to that restaurant and have a glass of wine and something to eat. Um, but it's but but it's, but tr in truth, it was pr pretty amazing because in Quebec City itself, you know, the buildings, some of them are that old because um, Quebec City had was forming as the center, and so we lived in Quebec City. Maybe we shot one day there, and then we would drive out about forty miles. Or not 40 miles, more than but 40 or 50 minutes out of town to the deep forest. And they had built, not they, um, her name is Isabelle Guy. She was our production designer and she was uh, French Canadian, I believe, and she, cause she was talking about her ancestors. She built a village in the middle of the forest uh, and it was stunning. The village that you see in the show, that's, you you walk through the the walls, you know, the, there's the walls and then there's the trees encroaching it on the outside. And so you always get that sense of the forest coming in. And she, yeah, she built everything. And it's a working village. You don't have to play. You don't have to imagine. You're just really slogging through the mud in your corset and your gown, your, your not gown, it's a heavy skirt. And you're really going into an old inn where the wood was hewn and there's really chickens running around outside and pigs and oxen real stuff growing in the garden so if you're like i'm gonna do a scene where i'm i'm picking eggplant like okay that would be over here and you could go shoot that scene it, it was um it was so venerable in a way it was so beautifully done that you felt like um, i better be as good as the buildings are because this is something pretty incredible she also built an Indian uh, or a native or third, I think now um, all the names are different, but then of course they said Indians. She built an Indian village and she built a mansion, the Doma. All those things are real. And then they built the tree, the tree house, the tree sky house, sky table. Now in this show, you're you know trying not to get stabbed by children and you're trying to run to get to the river. Uh, what what kind of uh, new challenges uh, as an actress did you find uh, this character provided? You know, I I do physical things anyway, so it really wasn't um, it that part of it. The physical stress, duress, whatever, wasn't difficult for me. I think the fun for an actor is transforming. The fun is wearing a wig and 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 wearing costumes that make you feel like the character. The accent was. Uh, challenge for all of us, sort of a nightmare, because we were kind of going in with the mistake that everybody sounds the same. 
and that there is one French accent and we should know exactly what to teach and do it, you know, and, and it, that's not real. That's not life. And that doesn't in any way exemplify where these people came from. My character came from the north of France. Another character comes from the south of France. Another character comes from um, America or from England. So everybody sounds different. And we had to relax into that and allow for that. Mostly we had to just go, no matter where you're from, if you have a different rhythm than what you think your country's sound is, we will know, like, France has a rhythm, and Italy has a different rhythm, and Japan has a different rhythm. So if you can just play a little bit with the rhythm, all the audience has to know is you're from someplace else. Because in the day, we would have been speaking French to those English people who would, were coming into our village. And we would sometimes we would make them speak French to us, and we would pretend like we didn't understand their French because it was so bad, uh, you know, like that. So the the animosity of language would have been set up right away. We don't have that, so all we can do is give you a sound to make you remember we're different. The French are different from the English. So that I think that was the tougher part for me. I do know that um, Thulis, David Thulis will say for him, it was the physical exertion, hiking up a mountain in the middle of mosquito swarms and with a hat and a veil and just being as hotter in the hubs of hell. That was in, in high, you know, men's high heels. So that was for him a bigger challenge for me. Like I said, I'm kind of used to the physical. So it, it was, it wasn't um, tough. It was fun. How was it uh, working with David Thewlis? What a dream. I mean, of course, we all know him from Harry Potter, right? So that's way from Naked and from Harry Potter. Um, I, I've loved him for a long, long time. I think he's incredibly talented and he's incredibly gentle and he's just a smart actor. And for him to, we didn't have any scenes together. We had one. So we were, you know, I was like slipping notes under the showrunner's door, Elwood's door going, please write me a scene with David. Please make sure David and I get to work together because I just always wanted to work with him. But our trailers were next to each other. And I will tell you, um, Marley, I made, a, I made a mean prune tart. I used to bring my prune tart to set. You know, the, the secret is you put armagnac in it. I saw it on Instagram, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really good. So I was like, in, fell in love even more with David the day. Sorry, can you hear that? That's my dog scratching. Um, I fell more in love with him the day that, um, that uh, it says nobody else is sending video right now. What does that mean? Oh, that's fine. Okay. Um, I fell in love with him. I fell in love with David Thewlis the day that he asked for a second piece of my prune tart. Because I used to bring it into the hair makeup trailer in the morning when it was still hot. I'd wake up at like five to put it in the oven to be ready when I got picked up at six. And I bring it in, it's still be warm. Dave's like, oh, I think I'll have another piece of that. I was like, yes, thank you. All right, so uh, this past uh, Emmy cycle, we also saw you on the first season of The Morning Show. And uh, I was watching the show, and I think you first appear at a function, you're giving a speech. I'm like, okay, that's a fun cameo. But then you just kept coming back, and you made it through the whole season. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering, uh, was that a surprise to you, uh, that the role ended up being so big, or is that kind of always planned? No, because you, when you're doing television, you don't get to see the full scope of it from the beginning. I knew that she was in at least three episodes because they sign you on for three, uh, but I didn't know how she was going to end up going. But because it's, it's loosely structured around Maureen Dowd, who's just such a, you know, ballsy woman, and so smart and such a great uh, reporter. Um, I guess they were developing the story that she would break the story and that she would kind of find, uh, find responsibility and culpability in the company. And so uh, it, it was lovely for me to, to find that because I knew she wouldn't be a light character, but I didn't realize she would be so important to the story and she really was. And I'd met her once. Um, she dropped her phone at the Oscars party and I didn't recognize her. And I was running after her to give her a phone and handed it to her and said, excuse me, you dropped your phone, ma'am. And then she had a beautiful gown. She turned around and she went, thank you. I'm Maureen Dow. <laughs> but but Morning Show hadn't aired yet. And I said, okay, that's great. And oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I am playing a version of you, kind of. And she was so cool. Um, because when when the show aired, she said, you know, I really didn't think that that story could be told again freshly and with 
you know, a lot of intelligence and et cetera. And she said, you guys, you guys did it. So that felt really nice. She's a great lady. Not just because she complimented us, but that helped. <laughs> uh, do you have anything to say about season two of that show? I don't know what season two is. I mean, it's got to be the demise of the company. It's got to be the turnover, I guess. I don't know what it is. I, I don't know if they're shooting now or if they were shooting or, you know, are my feelers are out, but I don't know. And finally, uh, I watched Pollock last night. Uh, are you aware that, uh, you know, at our site, we're always talking about the Emmys and the Oscars, and every single year we talk about your Oscar win because, you know, art's always subjective, but yours is the one that kind of defies uh, all the uh, statistics uh, and that you weren't nominated for various awards and you kind of surprise us at the end. So every year we say, like, okay, well, maybe this person will win or maybe it'll be like Marsha Gay Harden. Oh, I love that. Listen, I look back on it and I, I can't believe it to this day, especially when, you know, the time was kind of new for me. Not that acting was new for me, but the, the, the race and the Oscar race and all of that, the campaigning, all that was new for me. So it's not that I didn't think anything of it, but I think I didn't really think about the statistics in the way that I do now, almost, you know, however many years later. Now, it seems like it would be impossible. When I was nominated for nothing, no SAG, no Golden Globe, no this, no that, nothing. And then nominated, for, I mean, I did win the New York Critics Award, Film Critics Award. That was maybe it. And then to be nominated and to win, it was phenomenal. It's hard not to get choked up even now. Okay, Marsha, well, thanks so much for taking the time to chat. Uh, I look forward to our viewers seeing the show Barkskins. Uh, and to our viewers, you can make your Emmy predictions on goldderby.com and check out other chats with other Emmy contenders on our YouTube channel. It's nice to see you, Riley. Thank you. Thanks.